Today's presentation will be given by Christian Soracha, which I almost was going to butcher his name, but I asked. He is an assistant professor of political science at Colorado College and a former postdoctoral fellow at the Australian Center on China in the World at the Australian National University. He is the author of a recent book, Shaken Authority, China's Communist Party and the 2008 Sichuan Earthquake, which was published in 2017 by Cornell University Press. And he's written articles in Critical Inquiry, Comparative Politics, The China Journal, China Quarterly, among other journals. He is an also an editor of the Arts and Culture section of a new open access journal called Made in China. And his new research focuses on comparative urbanization in, and land rights in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and Inner Mongolia, China. Today he will be speaking on the mirage of development, the Sichuan earthquake, one decade later. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation to come and speak to all of you today. Let me make sure this microphone, okay. So I want to begin today's talk with a scene from a novel. Yen Lienke's novel, Lenin's Kisses, or Shou Huo, originally in Chinese, which provides a vivid example of the main concept I would like to discuss, the Chinese Communist Party's discursive path dependence. That is to say, its reliance on a set of legitimating narratives inherited from the past, which are indispensable to its survival. Yen Lienke's novel takes place in the fictional Balo mountain region of Henan province. The story begins with a summer blizzard that destroys Shuanghuai County's annual harvest. As a result of the untimely disaster, the village cancels its harvest festival. But when the party secretary of the township that administratively governs the village hears of the disaster, he decides to immediately launch a relief effort. Before the relief goods are even distributed, however, party secretary Leo instructs his secretary to write a report, quote, about how the entire township dedicated its efforts to disaster relief and to plan to hold the festival as an occasion, quote, to express gratitude to the government for its efforts on their behalf, end quote. In this scene, the party is reenacting the foundations of its legitimacy. After the disaster, the Communist Party's support for the people is reciprocated in their gratitude. And any other display of emotion is unthinkable as it would breach the ritual governing state society relations. And it is because of this logic that the party secretary Liu can instruct his secretary to write a report of an event that has not yet happened. The simple fact is no other script could be written. Like the scene in Yen Lienke's novel, the script of the post Sichuan earthquake reconstruction as a demonstration of the Communist Party's benevolence was written decades before the earthquake happened. As I will discuss in today's talk, Many of the Communist Party's key words and tropes used in the aftermath of the earthquake are inherited from the Mao era. And not because Xi Jinping is regressing or morphing into Mao, which I find to be a not very compelling argument, but because they are the basic grammar and vocabulary of the Communist Party's legitimacy. Which brings attention, uh, where is the clicker? Which brings attention to the main argument in my book that the Communist Party's legitimacy is in part rooted in the message that the party and it alone can represent the interest of and provide for the welfare of the Chinese people and protect them against chaos. And since the Communist Party claims this role solely for itself, it also makes itself responsible for all that is good and bad in the society. And it makes any dilution or sharing of its power with civil society organizations an existential threat to the basis of its rule, even if that relationship would be pragmatically helpful to achieve certain governing goals. This is not empty rhetoric, because it is not meant to be an accurate representation of reality. It is neither false nor true. Its purpose lies elsewhere in establishing and maintaining a framework of legitimacy. The discursive framework shapes the space of politics in China, it limits the range of possible policy options, establishes models of officially sanctioned expressions and behaviors, 
and draws a line around what can be counted as acceptable outcomes. So to illustrate my point, I will share with you one of my favorite slogans pictured here on the billboard along the Dujiang Yen Wenchuan Highway, um, which reads, when drinking water, remember the well digger, we rely on the CCP for happiness. The phrase comes from a story of Mao rolling up his shirt sleeves and trousers to help dig a well for a poor village suffering from a water shortage. That's pictured on the right. The uh, Dujiang Yen is pictured on the left. Um, the villagers were effusively grateful for Mao's act of benevolence. So here we have an example of a banner hanging in a disaster zone in 2012 when I took the photograph. Here's another banner referring to a story from decades ago that portrays the government as benevolent and the people as grateful. So in my book, I argue that what we are seeing is a modular blueprint of the Communist Party's legitimacy, which has survived China's vertiginous political campaigns and economic transformations. And this narrative circumscribes political activity and discussion on the part of both party officials and ordinary citizens. Subtly, Yet effectively, party discourse delegitimizes the complaints of disaster victims, who in turn believed that complaining was futile because they would be shamed by the party as being ungrateful. Containing negative emotions is only one part of the party's logic of effective sovereignty. The pervasive discontent among disaster victims had to be ideologically remolded into positive display of support for the party. So two years after the reconstruction, the party launched a gratitude education campaign, Gan and Jiao Yu Ho Dong, in order to teach people how to respond appropriately when receiving a gift. And this logic was laid out very explicitly in a speech given by the Wenchuan County Party Secretary at the time, Ching Li Dong, in 2010, who said, quote, at this time, we need to promote a culture of gratitude and use this culture of gratitude to eliminate socially unharmonious elements and increase members of society's sense of happiness by making people's agitated, blind, and impractical attitudes return to reason." End quote. For the few who persisted in rejecting the party's generosity, the state's repressive apparatus was at the ready. The Communist Party's discursive path dependence is demonstrated in its need for the display of gratitude among disaster victims, what Giorgio Agamben refers to as the, quote, liturgical politics of the modern state, end quote. For Leninist party regimes especially, authority is maintained in large part by control over discourse, which Xi Jinping refers to as hua yu chen, or discursive rights, and uh, Jiang Hao, Zhongguo de Gu Shi, telling China stories well. As Slavoj Žižek argues in reference to the lesson China learned from Gorbachev, quote, when history is given such a legitimizing role, of course it cannot tolerate any substantial self-critique, end quote. Hence the imperative to perform legitimacy and protect the discourse at all costs. So these are some of the main theoretical claims of my book. And the book itself is based on over 18 months of fieldwork in the earthquake zone from January 2012 to August 2013. Extensive interviews with government officials, NGO workers, disaster survivors, analysis of planning documents, party reports, speeches, and so on. I set out to the field actually in search of a model of consultative authoritarianism and participation in the disaster planning, but found it to be entirely absent. Instead, what I found was an ongoing recentralization of power and top-down showcase of the party's strength and legitimacy. So the first half of the book lays out the theoretical framework of the importance of understanding how the Communist Party uh, leaders think, talk, and act on the basis of underlying frameworks of power developed in the Mao era. The second half of my book looks at three different case studies of reconstruction, which are models of political economic development. The first is urban-rural integration in Dujiang Yen, the second is tourism in Yingshou, and the third is uh, ecological uh, civilization. For today's talk, I will draw from my chapter on Yingshou Township, which was the epicenter of the earthquake and designed to become a model tourist attraction. The bus from the Wenchuan County, the bus from Chengdu to the Wenchuan County seat stops halfway along the route outside of Yingshou Township. 
To reach Yingcho from the bus stop, it is necessary to cross a footbridge that traverses the Min River. Uh, standing on the opposite side for the first time in March 2012, I was struck by the sublime appearance of the township, precariously wedged between raging water and mist-shrouded mountains. As I crossed the footbridge and entered Yingxiu, its beauty gave way to an overwhelming sense of forlornness. In the words of one resident, the party built, quote, a beautiful stage without any actors, end quote. Since the earthquake, Yingxiu has been rebuilt as a political symbol of the Communist Party's glory and benevolence. It is an example of what I call the persistence of utopian planning, which is not place specific, but a composite of dreamlike images. As the epicenter of the 2008 earthquake, Yingxiu's reconstruction was purposefully designed in anticipation of higher level officials on inspection visits, global audiences, and awestruck tourists. In interviews with more than 40 different residents and multiple extended trips to Yingxiu, however, I barely came across anyone locally who viewed Yingxiu as a successful example of reconstruction. And the following joke reveals the deterioration of the Communist Party's image among local residents in Yingxiu. A TV reporter went to Yingxiu to conduct interviews. He asked an elderly man, did you hear that Guangdong province was donating 620 million renminbi to build a public cemetery only for party cadres and government officials? Um, what is your opinion on this matter? Don't you think this is a huge waste? The elderly man paused for a moment to reflect and then cheerfully responded, well, if they're going to be buried alive, then I absolutely approve. <laughs> Although it was not unusual in a post-disaster context for people to feel abandoned by the state in China as well as elsewhere, Yingxiu was not actually lacking in state capacity, presence, nor the political will to engineer growth. It had all of those things. It was swarming with party cadres, government officials, famous architects, urban planners, and engineers. The main pattern of discontent was villagers' perception that the Communist Party had used the reconstruction as an opportunity to improve its image and not to improve their lives. So in the words of a local anthropologist who also conducted fieldwork in Yingxiu, quote, if you try to examine things from the point of view of economic rationality, you will see so many examples of sheer irrationality, but there is a logic which is a political poetic one. In Yingxiu Township, the government did not consider whether or not Yingxiu's economy would be sustainable. They wanted to turn it into a symbol and display of the strength of the party, end quote. So what is this political poetic logic? It was a plan to create a world-class tourist destination that would host not only tourists, but high-level uh, leaders on inspection visits. As long as Yingxiu attracted favorable attention and publicity, the Communist Party's miracle of reconstruction would be validated, regardless of the experiences and opinions of local residents. Um, and the word miracle is not a word that I'm actually projecting. Uh, it's a word that the Communist Party uses in several uh, opinion pieces in the Renmin Robao. They refer to the reconstruction of accomplishing 20 to 30 year goals, 20 to 30 years of development within two to three years of the mobilization of, of, of the state to accomplish these reconstruction goals as a secular miracle. So I discuss that a lot in the book, but I'll skip over that here. And I'll skip over the section on how Yingxiu was planned to become an earthquake tourism brand and all of the different famous architects involved. And I'll go directly to my findings. Um, so despite the fact that hundreds of thousands of tourists have visited Yingxiu since the earthquake, local residents have received almost no income from tourism. Yingxiu's tourist activity is condensed around the Xunko Middle School earthquake relics and surrounding architecture. Businesses even a block over, not to mention those located on Yingxiu's periphery, receive almost no foot traffic. Many local residents, however, in anticipation of the officially promised tourism boom, converted their two-story homes into rural guest houses and open restaurants as well as souvenir shops. As of my last trip to Yingxiu in July 2013, 
Several businesses had already closed down, others were barely surviving, and almost none were profitable. And I still keep in touch with people on Ying, in Yingxiao via WeChat, and the situation has not improved. Um, according to one person, um, uh, I am without even a little bit of hope that my life will get better, end quote. And the reason for this lack of hope is that um, the, uh, the fact of dozens of rural guest houses, restaurants, and souvenir shops that all exist together have perniciously created an oversupply for a non-existent demand. As a result of Yingxiao's anemic economy, many residents decided to migrate to other cities for work. Not all people, however, particularly those in their 50s and 60s, have the ability to migrate. And another quote from a local resident, people who have money already left, the rest of us who do not have anything are stuck. What is someone my age supposed to do? No one will hire me as a migrant worker, so I am stuck here without a future, end quote. There are several other reasons why, Yingxi, why tourism in Yingxiao failed to provide incomes for local residents, and most of them have to do with the rushed planning and design, such as overly cramped apartments that cannot provide adequate or comfortable lodging for tourists. Yingxiao's regional location also works against its ability to attract overnight guests. Most tourists arrive in Yingxiao, spend a few hours in front of the earthquake relics and at the museum, and then return to Chengdu or proceed to the next destination, which is often the nature preserve Jiu Jai Go. So seldom do they even stay for dinner. There is also no good reason to stay there. Yingxiao lacks anything resembling a nightlife or entertainment facilities. Finally, the fact that nearly 7,000 people died during the earthquake in Yingxiao, including hundreds of children, envelops Yingxiao in a somber atmosphere unsuitable for entertainment-driven tourism. Um, as one tourist put it, too many people in Yingxiao died. There are too many ghosts here. If you stay for too long, it will bring you bad luck, end quote. Further, as I, t as I spoke with many of the um, hotel owners, uh, they were worried that the concept of earthquake tourism is too one-dimensional to be sustainable over the long term. After visiting Yingxiao once, there is no compelling reason to visit there again, unless you're doing field work. Um, perhaps the most damning evidence of Yingxiao's economic woes is the failure of a ray of sunshine tourism investment management limited corporation. So after a 7.0 earthquake uh, devastated the small town of Lijiang in Yunnan province in 1996, this tourist development firm, Array of Sunshine, made a fortune by transforming Lijiang into one of China's most popular tourist destinations. The company detected a similar opportunity to turn Yingxiao into a, quote, tourist resort that features earthquake tours and patriotic education, end quote, and signed a 40-year contract in early 2011 with the Yingxiao Township government. The resort consisted of hotels, tea houses, bars, commercial shops, and a venue for sunbathing. And so for any of you who have been to Sichuan, um, a venue for sunbathing doesn't make any sense because it's, over, over, it's always overcast and rainy. So after months of losing money, a ray of sunshine closed down their Yingxiao operations, withdrawing all employees as well as interior furnishings, as you can see in this picture. If a ray of sunshine cannot survive under these conditions, the prospects are rather bleak for local residents whose resources are even more threadbare. The extent of economic precariousness can be glimpsed in a series of local responses and criminal behaviors. According to a reliable local source, in the past two years, well, so this was in 2013-14, a, um, uh, a handful of destitute local residents have dismantled, stolen, and sold public infrastructures. And then to quote from a local judge, people are without work or land, so they steal public infrastructure to support themselves. All of the electrical wires in the public park built by Dongguan have been stolen. Some people have even been dismantling the sewers. Arresting them is of no use. When detained, their defense is that they have no other way to support themselves. So this is a bridge in Yingxiao, and underneath you can see the removal of all of the uh, lights from the bridge. Yingxiao residents were not only unhappy about their own economic prospects and living conditions, but also over what they perceived as wastefulness of government officials. 
So in the book, I argue that the tension of state-society relations in China is due in part to the fact that citizens and higher level officials inhabit different sensible realities. As I will discuss shortly, what higher level officials see on a leadership visit or lingdao shi cha is qualitatively different from how the local residents experience reality in their daily lives. Although a provincial level official on a tour of the reconstruction area might be pleased by the beautiful facades of new houses, their interiors may be threadbare and their inhabitants utterly destitute. So as waves upon waves of central and provincial level leaders descended upon the earthquake zone on, on compulsory inspection visits, they would inevitably stop in Yingxiao, the epicenter of the quake. Leadership visits began immediately after the earthquake and continued until the official end of the reconstruction period in 2011. And also, as I'll mention in my conclusion, Xi Jinping just visited Yingxiao a few months ago, and I'll come back to that. A leader would visit, display compassion for the earthquake victims, inspect the progress of the reconstruction, and move on to the next stop. But each visit required massive expenditures of resources, which most local residents, including several village-level cadres, regarded as excessively wasteful and obscene. In China's political system, waste is a contentious term, which suggests the capture and cannibalization of political and economic resources by the party state's aesthetic machinery. The theatrical staging of these leadership visits defeats their original purpose in the Mao era as ex inspections of local circumstances and the opportunities to gather information and adjust policy direction. Instead, the only information being transmitted during these visits are messages of success. So in the book, I propose that leadership uh, visits are liturgical practices during which the Communist Party's glory and benevolence is acclaimed. These visits are occasions for the idealization and cosmetic touching up of Communist Party leaders, traditions, and practices. For example, when one walks into the Yingxiao Earthquake Museum, the first thing that you see are blown up photographs of leadership visits captioned with descriptions of selfless devotion to the people. I actually haven't been back in a few years, but I'm curious if some of the people who have fallen in Xi's anti-corruption campaign have been removed from the museum, like in the olden days, um, or just kind of whited out. Um, okay, so let's see. The life of Yingxiao residents was constantly disrupted and influenced by leadership visits. They witnessed firsthand the expenditure, the violence, and the energy that went into the theatrical representations of their own happiness. And many of my interviewees directly associated their experience of leadership visits with a loss of faith in and disgust at the wastefulness of the Communist Party. So before Xi Jinping's official crackdown on governmental excesses, the unwritten rules of political culture dictated a lavish manner for greeting leaders. The reconstruction budget included what I call aesthetic expenditures on expensive flower arrangements, newly paved roads, banquets, and police entourages. According to a local journalist, any time a leader visited, township officials would purchase flowers. The moment the leader left, the flowers would be tossed in the garbage. And then the next day, the process would be repeated again. The local journalist also conveyed a story of um, the night before Wen Jiabao came to visit Yingxiao, um, he saw a construction worker paving an asphalt road in the middle of the night. When he asked the worker, aren't you afraid that paving at night the road would be uneven, the worker responded, no, because after Prime Minister Wen leaves tomorrow afternoon, the road will be torn up. And he went back to check, and the next day the road indeed was gone. Leadership visits also require the semblance of participation from earthquake victims. Leaders wanted to see completed work projects and satisfied local residents. In Yingxiao, this tendency allegedly reached absurd proportions. Before Prime Minister Wen visited hospital tents to console sick patients, 
Township officials um, transferred the patients to a nearby hospital in Dujiangyan. In their place, village cadres were hooked up to intravenous drips and injected with glucose in order to appear as sick patients. Only reporters from state-run news agencies, such as the People's Daily, Xinhua, and CCTV, were granted access to report on the event and enter the tents. According to one local village cadre I interviewed, I was very upset because Prime Minister Wen only visited the first tent and I was in the tent in the back. I went through all of this and I didn't even get a chance to meet him." End quote. One local villager described the event as a jiti shangbing, or collective sickness. Another young mother was livid because she was unable to obtain treatment for her son who was actually sick. People's interests can also be sacrificed in the name of political performance. Prior to the 2011 Spring Festival, the reconstruction of Yingxiao was still incomplete. Although housing structures were finished, the Dongguan Municipal Partnership Reconstruction Team still required a few months to address the remaining infrastructural issues. Despite the incompleteness of the project, the Yingxiao government decided to relocate the villagers into their new homes to celebrate Spring Festival. The Wenchuan County government published a celebratory article on their website with the headline, Yingxiao masses move into their new homes to celebrate the new year, including the obligatory photographs of local residents uh, gathering, singing, dancing, and wearing ethnic Qiang costumes. Soon after moving in, however, the local government was flooded with complaints by angry villagers whose new, new homes suffered from leaky pipes, um, uh, crumbling drywall, and other infrastructural issues. So to address this problem, the government actually enlisted a local NGO to conduct household surveys, identify the problems, and organize villager repair teams to address them. So in this example, a leaky pipe is not just simply a home repair problem, but it becomes a hyper-localized site in which the Communist Party's reconstruction and legitimacy is contested. So for local officials, moving the residents into their houses for spring festival displayed the party's mobilizational capacities as well as its benevolence and care for local residents. But by contrast, local residents measured the party's benevolence in the concrete terms of working pipes and safe living conditions. So the roots of popular contention and the deteriorating relationship between party officials and local residents in the earthquake zone reside in this clash between different sensible realities and interpretations of benevolence and care. The, oops, sorry. No, no. the idealized forms of party legitimacy, however, will always be defended against the complaints of individuals. In a different context, Akile Mbembe cautions, quote, we should not underestimate the violence that can be set into motion to protect the vocabulary and safeguard the official forms that underwrite the apparatus of domination, end quote. The Communist Party's political sensitivities were heightened during leadership visits because the careers of local township officials were also on the line. To protect their political achievements from unscripted voices and unruly bodies, officials often resorted to violent methods some Yingxiao residents conveyed to me their experiences of, of being forced to remain in their homes, placed under surveillance, threatened with violence, and occasionally beaten up. So ultimately, I argue that the Communist Party's discourse of building a harmonious society and practice of social stability maintenance are primarily about maintaining a specific order of appearances and protecting the symbolic forms of the party's legitimacy. Yingxiao residents felt betrayed by the wastefulness of the reconstruction, and many of my interviewees described feelings of heartache, disgust, and rage as they watched elaborate spectacles of leadership visits. For the earthquake survivor, Yingxiao was not a place to be lived in, but a spectacle of Communist Party's glory to be admired from afar. So Yingxiao continues to be important 
in the national political imaginary, and 10 years later, we see the miracle being revived yet again. So on the eve of the Lunar New Year, Xi Jinping visited Yingxiu, and during his visit, he laid flowers, bowed three times in front of a memorial for those who died and sacrificed their lives during the earthquake. He announced that he will spare no effort to preserve the earthquake ruins in Yingxiu as a site of patriotic education. During his visit, he also inspected a tea manufacturing plant in order to understand how tea production has allowed the masses to zhifu, that is, to become rich. He also participated in a uh, tea butter making uh, in a local village restaurant. Okay, so that's... Um, hmm, somehow I think my slides are out of order. Okay, but... Um, more recently, last week, as a matter of fact, the Wenchuan County government held a gratitude feeling cultivation event, or Gan En Ching Huai Pei Yu Gong Chang. The event, which contained singing, speeches, and accounts from disaster survivors, was live broadcast. And at the bottom of the um, at the bottom of the news article, they include photographs of all of the different county level departments being made to sit and watch the live broadcast. So you see all of the different offices and they're kind of glued to the screen. Um, and, um, and, and so all of these events were posted on the Wenchuan County Propaganda Department's WeChat account, which I assiduously follow. So a few days later, the same WeChat account also posted an article called, Who Would You Like to Say Thank You To? These posts are dedicated, I argue, to the production of um, uh, Guo Jia Zhi Yi, or national memory. So that's also how they're being framed in the WeChat accounts, as forms of how national memory is being constructed and protected, which is also a very interesting term, which we should think about, as it indicates that officially sanctioned memory and rituals of mourning as opposed to unauthorized private ones and expressions of grief. So because I'm running out of time, I'll only touch on a few of the salient themes um, that have come up in, these, uh, uh, in the celebrations, in the, official celebra in the official commemorations of the 10th anniversary of the earthquake. So clearly this is not my book, which came out last year, obviously. So um, this is all brand new, so please bear with me. So first, and perhaps most importantly, in these documents, gratitude is interpreted as a motivational force. In one video, Xu Ping, a disaster survivor and current delegate to the National People's Congress, states, Gan en shu wo qian jin de zui da de dong li. So gratitude is the biggest motivation for us to move forward and to progress. Here we see text that I cut and pasted from the, um, from the WeChat post. And in this text, gratitude is the foundation for all of life's endeavors. Grow up in gratitude. Gather strength in gratitude. Fortify your belief in gratitude. And so on. Gratitude is also to be transformed into morality. Hua en wei de. And morality, then, is to be the basis for one's actions and patriotism. Gan en yu xing. But the kindness can never be repaid. And this is from a video. I just took a screenshot of a song that was uh, also on the website. So it says here, you know, please don't worry. Um, we, will repay the, the, the pe we will repay the gratitude by building a new wenchan. But it can never be repaid because, to put it differently, it must always be unceasingly repaid through one's attitude, disposition, and actions, through the gratitude carved on your heart, which is a call to recognize that your new life was given to you by others, and it's never just yours alone. In the words of Wenchuan Party, the County Party Secretary Zhang Tongrong, Quote, we must be grateful to the party and the motherland for giving Wenchuan its second life. Be grateful to the people from all over the country to give Wenchuan the strength to be born again. Second, the gratitude event emphasizes ethnic harmony and national unity 
continually saying Zhang Chang Hui Han Er Nu, so the sons and daughters of the Tibetans, the Chang, the Hui, and the Han peoples, the four major groups affected by the earthquake. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, and I don't need to go into that more. Finally, how is the disaster remembered? I think we also need to understand these images and gratitude campaigns as being in response to the protests in the aftermath of the earthquake over the collapse of the tofu dreg schoolhouses and dead school children. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, after the, um, after the earthquake, um, several school buildings collapsed um, in places where government buildings and other, bu other buildings were left standing next to them. And over 5,000 school children died as a result. So parents started to protest and publicly mourn uh, the deaths of their children, but also demand an investigation into the, into the quality of the construction materials that were used in the schools. And so the term uh, tofu, uh, tofu dreg or tofu ja, tofu dreg construction material, actually wasn't invented in the earthquake. It was a term coined by Zhu Rongji in 1998 when he went to investigate a bridge that collapsed. But either way, that's just a nice historical reference for you. But the term comes back in 2008 in the aftermath of the earthquake when parents are demanding an official investigation into the construction quality of the schools, as well as um, a publication of the names and biographical information of all of the children that died. None of those things were ever officially publicized. So one thing that I've been thinking about when I've been watching all of these images, and this is another screenshot from a different video, is that um, part of this commemoration, the Communist Party does not ignore the fact that children died in the earthquake, but recodes it as part of a natural disaster and subtly reshifts, focuses, reshifts its focus onto the children who survived and onto their stories, as well as onto images of children born in the post-earthquake generation who are depicted as carriers of hope. Remember Mao's famous quote, the world is yours as well as ours, but it is eventually yours. You young people full of vigor are blossoming like the sun at eight or nine in the morning. Our hope is placed on you, end quote. So the party's gratitude is rooted in concrete stories that are meant to, you know, rangni uh, gandong, meant to tug on your heartstrings. And one such account is the story of Zhang Miya, who was a 29-year-old math teacher who used his body to shield and save the lives of two of, um, two of his students. When the rescuers came, the arms of Zhang's corpse were already stiffened and they had to amputate them in order to save the children. So in memory of Zhang, a song was written for him and performed at the ceremony. And also a, um, I don't know what you actually call it, but it's not animation, but where you draw on a board and then you can erase the images and draw over them. So it's, well, that, and I'm not gonna show the videos because we don't have time. But um, so that kind of, let's just call it animation, even though it's not animation. So that, that kind of video was also done uh, to celebrate uh, Zhang Mia's uh, selfless uh, sacrifice and also uh, shown on the website. And then after, um, during, the, during the ceremony in Wenchuan County, one of the students that he saved was brought up on stage to give thanks to Zhang's heroic sacrifice. So all of this is genuinely uh, moving. And, um, and some of the stories, m many of the stories that I heard when I was doing field work were, were just emotionally uh, wrenching. But it is precisely this emotional movement and effective flow which the Communist Party seeks to capture and channel towards itself as a political entity in China as a nation. After all, the last lines of the song written for Zhang Miya's sacrifice are, Rang Yingxiu de Hua Kai Zai Zu Guo de Chun Tian. Let Yingxiu's flowers blossom in the spring of the motherland. So these are not fake emotions, but these are real emotions that are enmeshed in discourses and dynamics of power 
which are part of what I call the Communist Party's effective sovereignty. So there's another video that I won't show, but I will describe briefly, which incorporates all of the above themes of ethnicity, unity, gratitude, and positive energy. In this video, we see people from all walks of life and in all different dialects, and in one case, uh, there's somebody even uh, expressing their gratitude using sign language. And a quote from one of the speakers in the video says, we give thanks to the party for their 10 years of solicitude, and now in return, we enjoy happy and blissful lives. When we get to the end of the video, however, there is only the smiling faces of children. I think that, oops, which, okay, so I skipped ahead. It's, it's, this is from that video. And so you see different images like this of, of, of children smiling. And I want to argue that this is a powerful politics of memory as well as a politics of forgetting that is encoded in these images. Finally, I want to talk about the idea of positive energy or zheng neng liang, which often occurs in these accounts. On the website, people are asked to come forward and to share their zheng neng liang de wu yao er gu shi or positive accounts of, the, of May 12th, which is the date of the earthquake. So gratitude is supposed to contribute to an attitude of positive energy. But there is a dark or shadowy side to all of this sunshine. To discuss the shadowy side, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, but to discuss the shadowy side, I want to take a quick detour into another recent event which is the public apology of Zhang Yiming, who is the creator of the technology aggregating platform Jinru Toutiao. For those of you who don't know, Jinru Toutiao is a, um, maybe I'm one of those who don't know. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's an aggregating platform that, uh, for, for, for news, and it's recently run afoul of the authorities for focusing too much on the technology and the algorithms of content aggregation without actually focusing on the political nature of the content. So in other words, people are allowed to share and have access to things that, um, that, are, that, that cause the Communist Party displeasure, um, or allowing content to be posted that's not in line with the CCP's core socialist values. So why am I talking about this in a talk on the earthquake? Because in his public apology, John repeatedly talks about gratitude as well as about positive energy. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show the way in which these kind of discursive elements aren't just limited to disasters and their aftermath, but, but fan out and saturate broader public discourse now. So John castigates himself for overlooking the responsibility to channel users in the update of information with positive energy, end quote, and to um, hong yang, zheng neng liang, or promote positive energy, end quote. And then he professes his gratitude and promises to give the people the positive energy they need to move into the new era. So just to quote, I thank this error, I thank the historic opportunity of economic reform and opening, and I thank the support the government has given for the development of the technology industry. A few paragraphs later, he, he continues and he says, we must ensure that the content of creation and conversation are positive, healthy, and beneficial, and that they can offer positive energy to the error and to the people, end quote. So what we see in Zhang's public apology and confession is what happens when you do not embody and display the proper affects of gratitude and positive energy. In the aftermath of the Sichuan earthquake, authorities poured massive resources into a reconstruction effort it believed would demonstrate the party's care for the people and the moral authority of its rule. The new homes, roads, schools, and hospitals were proof of the party's benevolence, power, and glory. In return for its generosity, the party expected the recipients to feel as well as to display in their thoughts and actions and speech a deep sense of gratitude. The ultimate acclamation of the party 
would be for the earthquake survivors to acknowledge in words and deeds the, content, the contentment that they were expected to find in their new lives. The title of my book, Shaken Authoritarianism, that's not the title of my book. The title, <laughs> there's a typo on the page. The title, eh, um, I'm, I'm, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not going to detour into jokes. I have one paragraph left, and then I'll save it for the Q&A. The title of my book, Shaken Authority, means that the Communist Party's grip on power is fragile as a result of its attempt to control and manipulate every outcome to conform to its legitimating narratives. The nature of the one-party system keeps the leadership and the cadres below them perpetually anxious about unforeseen events and unexpected problems. In the eyes of many international observers, each new crisis is expected to expose the tofu dreg foundations of China's political system, and yet, despite predictions of collapse, the Communist Party has to date demonstrated an admirable resilience in its ability to absorb the exogenous and internal shocks that shake its authority. Crises are moments of vulnerability, not only for the political system, but also for the people who are continuously reminded by the discursive environments they habit that their lives and well-being depend on the Communist Party and it alone. Thank you. As we are recording today, we appreciate it if you'd be willing to have your question recorded so it can show up on the, the videotape. Anyone have any questions? Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. This was uh, really uh, thought-provoking. So I, I'm, as a historian, I always tend to think about what's the most appropriate analogy for what's going on in one particular case. And one thing, of course, uh, that comes to mind is Eastern Bloc kind of um, movements of showing gratitude to a great leader, a great party. And, and I cannot, cannot help to think about a book that was written about the East German legal historian called Justice in Liritz, when she talks about how anxious the East German state uh, was. So, um, so what are the most compelling analogies that you would find in other Eastern Bloc states that are more general parallels, perhaps in other societies, that you would find perhaps more compelling or more interesting? to this kind of culture of gratitude and positive energy? That's a good question. Um, starting with historical examples um, that I think are important to understanding why the Communist Party is exerting such control over discourse and over the historical narrative. You know, Xi Jinping's anti um, um, or anti-historical nihilism is precisely because of their reading of what happened in the Soviet Union and Perestroika and Glasnost. And I think Alexei Yurchak makes a really interesting claim in looking at um, what happened in the Gorbachev years of opening up Lenin to the kinds of historical critiques and giving up the um, party's control over the monopoly of how to speak for and interpret and define Lenin as the symbolic bedrock. And once that bedrock collapses, then all sorts of other problems get, ma get magnified that were always there, but without the symbolic frame, right? So this is, this is um, so, so one answer to your question is that I think part of what Xi Jinping is doing right now um, by reasserting such control over ideology and discourse is to prevent that from happening. And then in terms of examples of gratitude, um, I can't think of um, any off the top of my head in terms of the Eastern Bloc, but a good example is from, the, uh, the, uh, from Han Feizer. And, uh, and, and um, I'm being recorded, so I'm just, try I'm just trying to think if, uh, I may tell the story wrong, but I'm okay with that. So the, the, uh, it, there, there's a story of a soldier, so just a putong, the you know, regular soldier, 
who is wounded and um, has an abscess, and the soldier is, is, is about to die. And then a military general comes over and actually sucks the poison out from the abscess to save the soldier's life. And so there's a debate on how to interpret this, and, 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 Han, and, in the, and, and Han Fei argues that this actually is not just an act of selflessness, but it creates a permanent relationship of basically debt and, 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 and servitude. So from henceforth, the soldier now will be willing to die for and do anything for the general. So in other words, Han Fei is arguing that at the, at, the, at the core of this logic of gratitude, you actually are installing a permanent kind of relationship of, of power. And you can also take this in a way that I know we don't have too much time for Q&A, so I won't take it in this way. I'll just hint at, you know, uh, Jacques Derrida also has a really interesting reading of gifts also as being reinscribed within an economy of debt, right? So if you give something and you demand that it's repaid in a certain way, Derrida kind of asks, is this a gift? It's not for Derrida. And also, it wasn't for, I, I interviewed a, a fairly, so I'm not going to say the place or the, or the rank, but I interviewed a fairly high-ranking party official who was extraordinarily candid about some of the problems in the aftermath of the earthquake. And when I was talking to him, I said, you know, a lot of the people in, in these villages are very upset over, over the houses they got and over, all of, and over the way it was handled. And he just looked at me and he said, this is in my book, so if I'm just paraphrasing the quote, but he looks at me and he said, if I give you a gift and it has nothing to do with you or what you want or what you needed, but I give it to you and I, and I insist that it's a gift, you know, is, do, is it still a gift? So he was also very, very well aware of the fact that what the Communist Party was uh, doing was in certain ways, and not, 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 a, not in all areas, but in certain ways disconnected from what the people actually wanted. But nonetheless, they still had to insist on this, this logic of the gift and gratitude and reciprocation. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And um, it, it echoes a lot of display of gratitude that one sees in China today. And, but because of that, I wanted to ask a question of like, the relationship between the event and the longer like, discursive um, l legitimacy work that um, it signifies. So do you think that um, this event of the one China earthquake is just a spectacular example of the discursive framework of legitimacy, or is it sort of like remaking the discursive framework in certain ways by remaking certain social relations, if you will? That's a really, really good question that I want to, to think more about. Um, my initial, or the way, the way I address it in the book is it's just part of a broader pattern um, so I am more inclined to see continuities from the Mao era to the present in terms of, you know, what, not in terms of obviously class struggle, the participation of the masses, all of those things are gone, but in terms of um, discourse, epistemology, and uh, approaches to how power works, right? Um, and, and, and so I think that we can see other examples over time of opportunities through which the Communist Party uses um, a historical event to reaffirm, redisplay, and perform these fundamental legitimating coordinates. Um, so I don't think, um, I think now these questions and practices are perhaps becoming more intensified and pervasive and less occasion, like, you know, less more about historical events and occasions and, and, and more as part of, you know, as Xi Jinping is attempting to re-engineer the political cultures and ecologies and things like that. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, actually, 
I can answer your question with, um, there's something that really fascinates me, which is Xi Jinping um, is, I don't, I'm trying to look for the right word for it, but um, one of his heroes that he said is Zhao Yulu. Zhao Yulu is the county level party secretary who worked himself to death after the Great Leap Forward. And so for those of you not familiar with the story, um, Zhao, uh, Zhao Yulu's county, I forgot off the top of my head where, um, but his county was experiencing natural disasters of all of these, uh, uh, I think sand dunes or like sandstorms or something. So, so he's leading a work team to basically save his county. And while he's doing it, he's feeling these pains in his side, but he's ignoring the pains and just focusing on his work. And then eventually he ends up being hospitalized because he collapses. And then his last words on his deathbed are basically, make sure you accomplish the goals we started. So his last words aren't to his family or to other people. They're to the party to finish the mission that he dedicated his life to. So in 1990, was it 1990? So, so at some point, Xi Jinping actually wrote a poem praising Zhao Yulu and referred to them, him, them, both of them as kindred spirits. Um, since he's taken power, he sent county level party officials to visit Zhao Yulu's hometown as a kind of education campaign, as well as uh, for other purposes. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to, to, to actually argue by giving this example is that Zhao Yulu stands for these forms of reverence, ideological commitment, discipline, and this is part of what I think she is doing um, to try to almost revitalize these uh, the, the moral claims of legitimate, the moral claims of the party's legitimacy by showing how cadres are dedicated to the people and doing things. So it's, it's kind of part of, of um, making good on the underlying state society relationship. Hi, so uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I had a question about historical analogies, but I actually just wanted to uh, go off of what you just said. You know, the, the theme of martyrdom in many ways is, is a continuity from the Maoist period, but I was wondering if you saw gratitude as a continuity from the Maoist period um, as opposed to, let's say, the imperial period, because at least from the early Maoist period, cadres were told precisely not to cultivate gratitude from the locals. They were told in giving land and emancipating the peasantry, we should not have a kind of ruler subject relationship with the people. They shouldn't feel like they're getting something from us. They should be earning, they should, they should be getting their hands dirty and earning stuff so they feel as if they themselves are emancipating themselves while the imperial government is more like you know if you don't obey us you're being ungrateful as if you're you know being ungrateful to your parents so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious what continuities and discontinuities you see between the maoist period and what she is doing that's a wonderful question it also prompts a nice paper idea or possible collaboration <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, so, so this actually came up before uh, when I gave this, uh, this talk in a different way where a legal scholar was talking in the late Qing period, how you'll actually, and again, I, I may be um, paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact term, but how there were certain empirical, <laughs> empirical, oh my God, imperial uh, edicts um, that were actually referred to with N, with the gratitude, right? Which were similar to, let's say, in kind of Christian conceptions of the dispensation of mercy, right? Where, where, the so where it's only the sovereign can dispense mercy um, and intervene and then expecting a kind of gratitude. And so that actually really fascinates me. And I've been wanting to go back and look at um, 
how n is used in the Maoist era in this particular way, and I haven't. So what, you're, what you just said then is, is really, really, really fascinating. And I think this could support kind of what we were talking about at, 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 at dinner uh, last night, which was the idea of the difference between the Mao era and the Xi era, besides all of the obvious differences that we know of no more class struggle and all of this, um, is the removal of the masses from the scene of politics. So if you correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're suggesting is that the end actually connects the um, imperial and the um, contemporary era more precisely because of its almost unilateral uh, configuration of the state society relation. Whereas the Mao era has a, has a different relationship between the party and the masses and the mass line and the mobilization and things like that, which is really fantastic and interesting. I, li I like the idea a lot. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually just, uh, uh, thank you for that. And I think there's a lot to be, to be mined there. Other question? Is that a, that's a, um, I have a question. <laughs> so um, I like the term that you used, which was effective um, sovereignty. And I'm, I'm wondering if in any of this work, because I, I admitted last night I have not read your book yet, but that's only because you haven't given it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's probably because the title is still unknown to you sometimes. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, my question about effective sovereignty is whether or not when you were writing the book, you looked, I mean, into some sort of comparisons in terms of how governments use these types of crises of natural disasters <coughs> or acts of war um, to, to, to engage in state building, mm. which it seems to me this is partly what the government is doing in China. Um, and I was thinking about the ways in which it differs to um, American memorials. And I recently went to the 9-11 memorial for the first time, and I was very attuned to um, the ways in which it tries to elicit certain types of emotions from um, the population. So I'm just wondering if, you're, if you looked at this all comparatively. Because at the end of your talk, you're saying that this is kind of fragile because there's so much control and manipulation from the top. And it's actually, I think, it's more effective in cases in, in sort of democratic societies where it's, there's less control, there's seemingly less manipulation, um, but the emotion uh, manipulation is still there. I think that's uh, also another really good paper idea. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful question. And the comparative aspect I look at in the book is, um, actually more about how China represented and compared itself in editorials and the Redmond Rovau and others to other disaster relief in Japan and most specifically in the United States. So in the conclusion, I, I discuss the ways in which um, China, uh, Chinese government continually brings up Oh, well, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, you have people still living in trailers eight years later, and it exposed the racism, the underlying racism, and all of that's true, right? But they're using it in a way to frame it by showing. So if you have a top-down, one-party system that can mobilize basically all aspects of the state, then you can put, so, I mean, think about this number. This is, this is pretty impressive. Um, uh, now I'm forget. I don't. Now I'm forgetting the number. Um, but uh, the, uh, it was in one part of a talk that I that I removed. So so over more than the entire municipal population of Los Angeles were were rendered homeless in the earthquake. So we're talking several million. I think four or five million. But don't quote me on that. Even though this is being recorded. Um, and so the Chinese government basically made sure almost four to five million people were moved into new homes in under three years. Now there is something rather miraculous and amazing about a political system that can do that, but at certain costs. So the comparative element is, is, is very limited in terms of talking about how China uses comparison as a method to highlight the strength of its own political system. But in terms of also effective sovereignty, that term doesn't come up in my book because I just came up with the term for a paper I wrote that will come out in January with public culture on televised confessions. 
um, it, so uh, of cadres in China um, that have happened in the Xi period. And I'm trying to, 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 to look at Liz Perry's uh, motion work, um, is it motion work? And, and those arguments and then uh, develop them into, into, into um, the contemporary period. But I completely agree with you that mourning, martyrdom, um, sacrifice, all of these questions also play a huge, huge role in, in other political systems and cultures, and especially in the United States, if we can, um, because what happens when you, when you actually lose the discursive frame that makes sacrifice meaningful, then it actually becomes a meaningless gesture. So I remember specifically in the early 2000s um, with the uh, invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq and the whole argument even among liberals and leftists in the US of whether or not support the troops, right? As, 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 as a way of, um, if you say, no, I don't support the troops, then you know what would that actually mean? Uh, um, that would, um, that would call into question at least a framework that makes sacrifice meaningful and still kind of protects its discursive boundaries. Does that? But, uh, but no, I think though as a, I think as a, as a future work, a comparative analysis of these kinds of um, official commemorations, it would be extraordinarily fascinating. So uh, I want to thank you for the great talk. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me.